Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where once again we are live from Rome with archaeologist Darius Aria today to learn a lot about what archaeologists do and how archaeologists help the ancient civilizations tell us the stories that they want us to know. And we're live in Rome. Darius is also going to take us through the magic of recorded video on some of his other archaeological excursions to uh, to places like Egypt as well. And so, uh, so uh, get ready for a pretty great great tour of not just Rome, but the entire world. And to help us, we've got an expert team of tour guides here. We've got our Ancient Adventures campers here this summer. Ancient Adventures campers, say hello to everybody who's out there having a great time. So our Ancient Adventures campers here have been exploring ancient civilizations this summer with uh, with varsity tutors and, and just got to do a little uh, mini tour of Rome here with Darius. If you're interested in a camp like Ancient Adventures, you're in luck. Uh, have a camera nearby because in about 30 minutes, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to take a vacation selfie to uh, to Rome with Darius and his cool background you guys will see here in just a second. If you upload that to Instagram, you'll be entered to win a spot in Ancient Adventures Camp. Um, but also, if, uh, if you just want to learn more about it and get enrolled, we've got a new crew starting every Monday. There's a link on your screen where you can learn a little bit more. Also, one other instruction for you before I, uh, I turn it to Darius live from Rome. You know, the, the saying goes, hey. when in Rome, uh, do as the Romans do. The Romans like to communicate. They like to talk. And uh, this class is no exception. Use the chat box to the right to answer Darius's questions. He wants to find out what you know about ancient civilizations, what you think and what you'd like to know. And so where it says ask there, you can chat anything. You can ask questions there. You can answer questions there. There's also a polling area. We have a few multiple choice questions there. So keep it interactive. Have a camera nearby. Uh, when we do that selfie portion, we'll give you a chance to upload it to Instagram for a chance to win a, a spot in Ancient Adventures Camp. And so with all of that, let me turn it over to your teacher for today, Dr. Darius Aria, live in Rome. Hey, everybody. I'm here in Rome, and that's the pyramid tomb of Gaius Cestius, over 2,000 years old. And today, what we're going to be talking about is, of course, archaeology. We're going to be talking about why people were interred, why they were buried, along with their ideas of immortality. We're going to be then looking at artifacts and what they can tell us about the past and the beliefs about the past and the afterlife. And finally, what is, what is the future of archaeology? What does the future lie in store for you if you're interested in exploring the past? So I'm really excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, I'm an archaeologist. Uh, I'm digging in the past. I'm preserving the past all about transmitting this to future generations, to you guys that are tuning in today. I wanna to show you a little bit about uh, why archeology span is relevant to our lives today. And I want you to think about uh, ways in which um, you can reflect on your own lives and you know, where you're gonna be in the future and what kind of legacy you're gonna leave behind. So think about for a second, a thousand years from now, okay? So it's 2021. And then a thousand years from now, it's 3021. What are people gonna be thinking about you? What are people gonna be thinking right now about 2021? What are the big moments of the year? The Olympics, social media, that viral tweet that you did? You know, think about climate change, what's going on with the planet Earth. So think about the things, the kind of legacy, what we're leaving behind, what people are going to be reading about this particular year. And then think about archaeology. Archaeology is then about uh, sifting through this evidence, piecing together the stories from the past, and, and then interpreting what it actually meant. And oftentimes, almost always the case, you only have a certain number of pieces of the puzzle. With archaeology, unfortunately, you don't have the whole house. You don't have the entire artifact. You have just bits and pieces. So think about what you want people a thousand years from now to know about you. So what are you going to leave behind? Once you type in some answers, let me give you some ideas. Give me some ideas about, about what's your legacy right now in 2021. So maybe it's your siblings, okay? You leave something behind about your, your pet what your sports are, what your hobbies are. So the whole thing is that whatever you're leaving behind, whatever text you're leaving behind or your diary or your artwork, 
someone one day will find some of it and they're going to be then studying what is left behind that's probably only partially preserved and trying to understand you in the past so let's think about people of the past and how we can piece together their stories by what they leave behind. And that leads us to then really, what is archeology? span Archeology span is, well, something exciting. It is basically detective work. It is about pulling together disparate threads of information. Sometimes you get information from old photographs of a site. Sometimes it's because you've talked to colleagues that have excavated in the nearby area. Sometimes it's about applying new technologies. We can't excavate here, but we can use ground penetrating radar to learn more before we even start to excavate. So we're looking at ancient languages. We're looking at the ancient artifacts. And of course, in the end, we're trying to tell stories. So we're taking that data, we're taking that information, we're taking the analysis of the bones of the deceased and we're pulling together and coming up with a story. We're doing it on physical locations and archeological sites. We're going into museums. We are going to storerooms. We're asking the questions and hopefully as an archeologist in the end of a particular study, we're coming up with the answers. Sometimes they're only gonna be hypothetical answers that then might be disproved, but we'll do our best to refine those questions and those answers as we move forward. So archaeology is really about discussing the past. It's about looking at the monuments, the whole cities, the inscriptions, the things that define people and their lives. And so many times we think about ancient civilizations, we are thinking about their tombs because that is where so many ancient civilizations gathered up, made the biggest efforts, spent the most money, that's the thing that's going to be permanent. It's going to be eternal. That's the idea because it's tied in with the belief systems of these various ancient peoples, whether it be the Romans, the Greeks, or the Egyptians. They're making a big statement. And of course, today, when you think about us, how long do we live? Maybe we'll live to 80 years old. Maybe we'll live to 100 years old. But back in ancient times, we lived maybe 30 or 40 years. Time was short, death was on your mind. So now we're taking a look at um, this, uh, these ancient pyramids. And we can ask ourselves, what is the point of an ancient pyramid? Is it a great engineering feat? The Great Pyramid of Giza was almost 500 feet tall. It was for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the tallest made man, man-made monument anywhere in the planet. So why are you building something so large? Why are you going to this great expense? Is it about engineering? Is it about your, your ego? And we got to think about the different ways in which we can show off our achievements to future generations. And of course, in the end, the purpose of the Egyptian pyramids I'm seeing some answers here, getting some comments. Of course, it's not just an engineering feat. It's not just a billboard to how great you were. It was a tomb. And of course, we're gonna be talking about a lot of tombs today. And we're gonna take you inside some of these tombs as well. So why are tombs so important for an archeologist? Now, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you, me personally, I love the ancient sculpture. I love exploring the urban plans of ancient cities. I love those big monuments, the arches and the statues and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the theaters, the amphitheaters, the gladiators performed. But it's the tombs that are real treasure troves for us because people from whatever walk of life are putting the best they had to offer. So whether you're poor, middle-class, very, very wealthy, you are a king or a queen, you're always putting the best that your life has to offer. You have the best ways of then bringing something with you is the idea with you in the afterlife. Because people believe, and, and civilizations believe today, and the religions today as well, to believe about the immortality of the soul. So where do you preserve this special place for your soul? 
of the deceased to enjoy the benefits of the living, it's inside that tomb. And that becomes then the place where you want to concentrate wealth and architecture in a monument that then people can also remember you as they pass by. And that's a way also in the ancient mindset of perpetuating your life and your afterlife, right? But you want to take it all with you and you can in the ancient civilizations, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, the Egyptians. It's I'm in that tomb and I'm enjoying all the benefits of living the hereafter with hopefully wealth and beautiful paintings and artwork and so forth. So we do want to think about tombs are fundamental in the history of the archaeologists. And some of the greatest things discovered from ancient civilizations are indeed in tombs. Now, because we're talking about tombs, let's talk about tomb raiders. Who knows what a tomb raider is? Let me, let me hear it. All right, somebody's going to say Laura Croft, I know. Someone's thinking about video games. Someone's thinking about movies. But a tomb raider, and we can also think about Indiana Jones. And of course, I, I grew up with Indiana Jones. I loved Indiana Jones. I want to be an archaeologist because Indiana Jones is wonderful. But well, what's going on there in these movies? Is there proper archaeology going on there in investigation? Or are they simply finding something great and taking it away, right? It has to be the museum or whatever. Proper archaeology doesn't work that way. Proper archaeology is very slow. A lot of documentation. We're not running around with a bullwhip being chased by Nazis. So tomb raiders, the real story, they're not glamorous. Tomb raiders are thieves. Tomb raiders destroy the evidence. Tomb raiders just want the monetary value, the jewels, the gold, that rich history. And they want to sell it to somebody and make money. So tombaroli is what we call them in Italy. They're bad people. They're greedy people. They destroy history. So unfortunately, tomb raiders are all over the world. They're looting sites all over the world. They're destroying history. And thankfully, we do have a lot of people involved. Police forces, the Carabinieri in Italy, are the best in the world at recuperating stolen history. So it's a very, very involved discipline. Maybe in the, down the road, if you're interested in archaeology, you might want to go in that particular uh, area as a in the police force or as a lawyer i have a lot of lawyers uh, in the field that are very much involved in recuperating stolen history and it's a beautiful thing when they can return something stolen to its home country but right now let's take a look at a number of the tombs on the inside we'll start in ancient egypt here we are in giza with the great pyramids of egypt there's the sphinx and we'll focus our attention on the Great Pyramid, the largest pyramid, the Pyramid of Khufu, dating to 2600 BC. And there it is. That's composed of 2.3 million large blocks of stone, originally 484 feet high. Today, it's about 454 feet high. What a monster. You entered originally through entrance at number one, the robbers entry point is at number two you go up a shaft number six into a gallery at nine and finally into the central chamber number ten let's explore okay this is intense in the heart of the pyramid absolutely Amazing. Here we are inside that central chamber. It's been entirely robbed out. Here's the sarcophagus that was discovered. And of course, go to the Cairo Museum to see the sorts of things that were buried in the tomb with the Pharaoh, with the separate chamber for his wife. We have statuary of yourself. You have statuary of servants that would accompany you and serve you in the afterlife. 
Of course, there's going to be all kinds of jewelry artifacts that are luxurious, and the Cairo Museum is filled with discoveries from tombs, including containers holding the organs of the deceased that would lie forever in the sarcophagus, beautifully decorated for all eternity. All right, so I got to tell you, it's, it's a real thrill to take you with me inside the great Pyramid of Giza, and you can see it's a very tight fit. This wasn't a place that you would visit in antiquity. It was all sealed. So the only way we're allowed in it today is that we enter through the robber uh, trench that was obviously created in the Middle Ages or thereafter to rob out everything precious. But I got to tell you, even though it's been robbed out, it is still an extraordinary experience to, to be immersed in the heart of the biggest pyramid of, uh, of ancient Egypt. Now let's take a look. Let's take a look at the at another pier, at another tomb of the Etruscans in ancient Etruria or Tuscany. Can you hear me? The Etruscans were very successful in trade and warfare in the area of Tuscany today, just north of Rome and Lazio. And they built these huge tumulus mounds with their local volcanic stone. And inside were the burial chambers that you could visit annually to pay your respects to your dead ancestors and also add future family members inside. So this is a big family tomb that kind of replicates inside the house of the Etruscans with the separate chambers for the the body to be laid or placed in a sarcophagus. And other tombs are beautifully painted with fantastic scenes of uh, merrymaking and partying and athletic competitions. You're held inside a sarcophagus for all eternity with your portrait outside, surrounded by images of your gods that favored you, and all kinds of artifacts from your life. Maybe a precious bronze, of terracotta with your spouse, showing your athleticism. This is used to scrape off the olive oil that was rubbed into your bodies when you went boxing. And of course, imported vases from ancient Greece. All this shows what you took with you in the afterlife. What I like about the Etruscans is that they were heavily trading with the Greeks, in particular in the sixth centuries BC, the fifth centuries BC, and they acquired so much wealth, they bought it from the Greeks, and then they placed the nicest things in their tombs to enjoy in the afterlife. And we have some of the greatest Etruscan museums filled with artwork from those tombs, such as the one that I saw you. So your one-two punch as you're exploring the Etruscans today is you go to the big tomb sites like Banditaccia that I showed you, and then you go to the Etruscan museums in the Vatican museums and throughout Rome. Let's take a look at some great tombs that I love in the city of Rome. Okay. This is Petra. Petra was the capital city of the Nabataeans people that became rich in trading through uh, bringing the spices, the frankincense from the Arabian Peninsula to the rest of the Mediterranean offered to the gods. They built elaborate tombs for themselves, cut right into the faces of cliffs. And of course, these were tombs that were meant to be admired and they were meant to be celebrated. And these particularly large tombs in Petra in modern day Jordan, we don't actually have any of the inscriptions preserved, but in other locations of the Nabataeans, we do. They belong to men, they belong to women that were successful and wealthy. And we can peer inside because they were chambers meant to be frequented by people celebrating the dead, going there and honoring them with a ritual meal. Normally the walls were uh, covered in frescoes. And of course there were all kinds of accoutrements for having a nice, festive meal on behalf of the deceased wine was poured offerings were made to the gods and the memory of the person deceased was perpetuated 
That was Petra, I apologize. Petra is, of course, a Romanized site by the second century AD. It becomes actually a province of Rome under the emperor Trajan. And so what you're getting there really is the indigenous Nabataean peoples of let's say Jordan, the country of Jordan today, all the way down to the Arabian Peninsula, but also intermingled, a mixing of cultures for the Greek world and then of course the Romans. Now we can turn to uh, artifacts and turn artifacts into facts. And we can actually take a look at uh, one such particular artifact. Does anyone know what this is? You see this image of what we call an enshingo bone. Does anyone know what that is? It's actually literally an animal bone, a series of them. Is it for a tabletop? Is it a musical instrument? Well, actually what it is, is an ancient calendar counting system. It was used to count or tally different amounts of, of materials. So what archeology span is about, and the job of the archeologist is to find something and then understand from the context, what is going on? What is the identity of the particular thing? So we're detectives, you can say it like that. And uh, you know, with all artifacts that we'll find, even when we do recognize them, you know, like this is another loom weight, or this is uh, you know, part of a book or a stylus pen, but then it's what's the context in which it was used? It was discarded in a, in a pile. It was uh, you know, placed into a tomb because the person was a scribe. I mean, we just want to figure out the real story behind the actual artifact. The artifact in and of itself only takes you so far. We can go further doing proper archeology. span Let's take a look at some more artifacts. When we think of death and the afterlife, what are you going to have buried with you in your tomb? Well, precious articles like jewelry, images of friendship and companionship, and of course, even your lucky dice. So in each case, there are particular unique features that people would celebrate and of course have a ritual meal throughout the year to commemorate the dead in the, in the ancient Greco-Roman world. So we have many bones in bowls that are found in tombs that haven't been ransacked by tomb raiders. Here's what the Carabinieri, the police of Italy, have recuperated time and time again, tens of thousands of artifacts that were once in people's tombs and then are uh, sold to people all, all over the world. Here's some of the finds that they have recuperated. Here is a tomb that shows you what an actual funeral looks like. Procession, music, celebration, and commemorating the dead, of course, also in the afterlife with precious articles like this drinking cup in the shape of a dog. Images of terracotta of deceased relatives. And of course, time and time again, that precious import. The Etruscans were fascinated with buying the vases made by the Greeks in Athens. And of course, precious uh, artifacts made of bronze. These were found from tombs over centuries and centuries before the unification of Italy in the 19th century. And of course, now they're in the National Gallery. It gives you an idea of what people associated with images of daily life, celebration, athleticism, and of course, you would celebrate yourself with your spouse and your sarcophagus prevalent in the second century AD. But artifacts could also be modest because a lot of people didn't have a lot of money. So little figurines of mother goddesses could be interred with you. Of course, the emperors looked to be divinized as gods. The rest of us could only hope for being remembered by our relatives. So the main thing I think uh, to keep in mind about artifacts is we want to know the context. Just keep that in mind because archeology span is about preserving that full picture. The artifacts are wonderful and in and of themselves are precious artistic creations. But if we don't know the context, we don't know where it came from, we've lost so much. Here are three artifacts that I like I want to share with you. One is an actual doll. Take a look at her. She was found in 1889 when a big building was being created along the Tiber River. And look at, she's got working arms and her knees bend. It's like a Barbie doll from 2000 years ago. I'm just fascinated by this. We also found her uh, a young woman with the doll. 
she had her jewelry. And guess what? That doll has her own makeup box, her own little mini mirrors, her own little earrings. And she even has a little key ring and the key would open the box that was made of ivory as well. This figure is made of ivory. Think about how expensive that was back then to have a working Barbie 2000 years ago. It was, it's just amazing. Uh, the scent, her name is Creperia Trifanea. So we have her name preserved as well. She's Greek, but living in Rome in an international city. The next center uh, image is not that lavish. It's a simple urn and the cremated remains of the deceased are placed in the urn. It's a cheap tomb. Not everybody was having a big tomb of, looking like a pyramid 30 meters high. Most people were very modest in their means, but they needed to be buried to lay their bones and their spirit to rest. So here's a very modest artifact, an actual little urn that we excavated out near Ostiatica. And the last example is a little figurine of a gladiator. So think about that. You go to the gladiator games, children not allowed. Here's son, here daughter, here's a little gladiator. Here's your little action figure. So there are different things that we want to be buried with, the things that we're going to take with us to the grave. And sometimes you find even children's toys uh, in the graves of the deceased children. So now we want to take a look at this one particular image. I was very privileged to go and take a look in this hole. It is the remains of, well, a kind of tomb that is associated with Romulus. Uh, here's a very ancient tomb. When was this discovered? Was it discovered last year, 20 years ago, in early 1900s when the forum was excavated, or even the 1800s? So the answer is last year. So it was something that it turns out it was kind of rediscovered where you had the uh, notation of a, of a tomb area underneath the steps of the Cordia or the Senate house. And then it was totally forgotten. And that was from the early 1900s. And then the rediscovery discovery was, oh my God, it's actually like a whole tomb chamber. So that was a pretty big deal during the case of conservation work going on in the Roman forum. So sometimes when you're doing maintenance work in archeological sites, you make new discoveries. And of course, there's no place that's more historic than the Roman Forum. So sure, you're always going to be finding something new. But that was a big surprise. And that was really exciting to be able to take a look at it. And that investigation is actually continuing. So now we want to think, as we're wrapping things up, and I'm going to take you over here to the pyramid, is what, what can we discover as we're thinking that next year, it's a hundred years that we'll have the discovery of King Tut in Egypt. One of the most spectacular, probably the most spectacular tomb ever discovered and really gives us an idea of what the pharaohs were capable of that they wanted to take with them into the afterlife. All that gold, all that pageantry, all that wealth. What a grand discovery. And we want to think about still today, how much more is still underground for us to investigate. Let me come with me. We're gonna come right over here and I'm gonna show you what I mean. And what I mean is that everywhere we're walking, there's something ancient to still to discover. So come on, I'm gonna come right over here. And we see the pyramid here. Now take a look down. So the ground level of ancient times is not the ground level of today. Things get buried, things get forgotten, things fall apart, big monuments collapse, walls collapse and so forth, and the things get buried only to be rediscovered. So as we're looking here at this grand, grand pyramid that's 2000 years old, the tomb of a man that was a friend of the emperor Augustus, we can see here that, well, it doesn't get, forgotten because it's so huge, but a lot of it has to be dug out. So think about then in this, this neighborhood alone, what still is to be dug out, what still there is to discover. And if you're interested in archeology, span how much more that you can still discover with the uses of new technology, new ideas, 
asking new questions to old problems, things that have never been solved or things that have never been still discovered, but we know that once existed, like the tomb of Cleopatra, people are still looking out for that. I think there's a lot of opportunities for you to discover the past and get really excited about preserving the past for your generation and future generations. And I think we can, uh, we're going to take some pictures and we're going to be taking questions. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for an amazing tour. And I love ending where you did sort of with, you know, there's, there's still plenty to dig on. There's so much more that's not uncovered. You know, we've, uh, we've discovered a lot, but there's so much more to discover. So I think it's a challenge for all of you out here who are interested in archaeology, interested in ancient civilizations. You know, I think it's easy to think that, you know, hey, so many of these things, it's been around for thousands of years. We've probably figured everything out. And no, 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 actually, there's so much more to, uh, to learn and discover. And so thanks for, uh, for passing along that message. Um, all right, a couple things for the crowd out there. Um, one, of course, we can't take you to Rome and, and not give you a, a picture to remember it by. So start getting those cameras ready. And, uh, and as you're logging into the phone, kind of lining up, we're going to put uh, Darius on full screen here in just a second to, uh, to make sure everybody gets a, a great Roman vacation shot here. If uh, if you upload that to Instagram after class and tag Varsity Tutors and Darius Aria, we'll have the uh, you know the official handles to uh, to tag in just a second. We'll let Darius get, uh, get lined up where he wants to be here in just a second you'll be entered to uh to win uh, a spot in ancient adventures camp like all those uh friendly faces you saw on screen a little bit earlier also make sure you keep your questions coming in i know we've got lots of them we covered a lot of ground today and so in just a minute uh after the fixtures we'll uh, we'll get okay. some of your questions answered including some uh some questions live on air from the uh, ancient adventures campers but i think we're set for the pictures of so darius let me turn it back to you okay. and uh, make sure everybody gets that photo here so um yeah everybody let's uh, let's get those vacation pictures Tell everyone that you went to Egypt today. <laughs> Not everybody comes here. This is a fun place. Yeah, and so actually with that, so hopefully everybody got great pictures. Remember, click on the, click the link on your screen to learn a little bit more about Ancient Adventures Camp if you want to register. Uh, everyone can register. We'll have one winner of the contest. And again, we'll have all that information up on a slide on the way out. Um, I think one of the most common questions we had, Darius, is tell us a little bit more about where we are right now. Sort of what are we seeing? What's the history of that pyramid yep. uh, and tomb there? Just sort of where are we in relation to, you know, for those who have been to a lot of classes in this series, yeah. you know, we've been to the Colosseum, we've been to uh, you know, Julius Caesar's last spot in, uh, you know, in the Coria there. Uh, we've been yep. to a couple other places. Where are we right now? And, uh, and what should so we know on it? We're further south of the center of Rome. So we're south of the Forum. We're south of, so we have the Forum, then the Palatine Hill, then the Circus Maximus, and the Aventine Hill, and then just a little beyond that. So we're coming out to the southern part of the city. And you go to the Ostian Gate, the gate behind me, and that's the gate that would take you on foot on the road out to the port city of Rome at the mouth of the Tiber River. So you're heading out here to the coastline from this gate. So it's a place then that you would bury the dead. You bury your dead outside the city walls. That's just standard practice. Some of the exceptional like Julius Caesar is buried within the boundaries, but everybody else, they're buried outside the walls. And part of it is because a lot of people are cremated. So if you cremate somebody, you're reducing the body to ash, you have a big fire. So you don't want to have a bunch of fires burning inside your city. It's safer to do it outside the city. And of course, it's kind of like, where do we have a, a cemetery in our, in our cities today? It's kind of out where it's nicer, more pastoral, more countryside. And in fact, on the other side of the wall here, there's the famous Protestant cemetery. So this is a, on the other side of this wall, there's a beautiful, beautiful historic cemetery, you know, about a 200 years old. So it's not that old, but it's a lovely place to be laid to rest right in the heart of Rome. Otherwise, all, all other Romans were outside the city as well. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks as always for, uh, for getting us to some amazing spots in, in Rome. We'll have those. We have uh, got a first on air question here. Owen here yeah. wanted to ask a question for you. So Owen, you are uh, live with Darius in Rome. Uh, what's your question? Like 
Why did the pharaohs have the things in there when they were in, in the tomb? Ah, so yeah, the reason why they have so much, you know, they even have food. They even have, like I said, you know, they, they take their organs and they put them, you know, safely preserved in jars. Because they, you kind of want to cover all the bases and have every part of yourself, as well as all of the, the benefits uh, that you get from when you're living. So it's the food, it's the artwork, it's the, the representation of the servants who will serve you then in the afterlife. But they just wanted to have all the bases covered. And this is something really just for the, for the wealthy and then for the, the leaders of society, like the pharaohs. Right? The average person would have much less. Awesome. Thank you for that. And uh, let me get us all here on screen. We've had a bunch of other questions. So one, again, thank you for um, giving us, you know, such an amazing tour, not just of Rome, but of, of so many other locations that uh, that we were able to, uh, to join today. So a lot of questions about sort of your experience, you know, your favorite places you've been and favorite archaeological spots. Tell us a little bit, do you have a, a favorite archaeological location where you've discovered something and, and, and maybe a favorite discovery or just, you know, something you, you were able to accomplish? Tell us a little bit about your favorites as, as an yeah. archaeologist. I, I, I've done a lot. I mean, I've done a number of field schools in and around Rome. So obviously, I'm very partial to Osti Antica, the port city of Rome, where we excavated out a number of uh, fourth and fifth century AD houses, as well as a lot of tombs. So that's exciting to be able to uh, have that experience of excavating tombs. Um, you know, I also excavated part of a, a, a villa with a bath complex. And it's really neat to be able to, 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 to recover statuary from uh, that, those places as well. One particular statue is beautifully preserved, so nice that the eye was inlaid with bronze on public display in a museum in Rome. So there's a lot of really good, exciting uh, opportunities that I've had in excavating. But I also love travel. And I tell you what, I mean, some of the most extraordinary tombs, I did show them to you today. Uh, the Pyramid of Giza, the tombs of Cervetere, the Etruscan tombs, and then of course the Nabataean tombs in Jordan. I was just blown away. Yeah, that was amazing scenery. And I think, uh, you know, for, for me, I, I didn't expect to be able to get inside a, a pyramid with uh, with a class like this. So a uh, so huge thanks for that. Just what a, an yeah, amazing experience. And I know we, we focused a lot on, on, on tombs and things today. Um, and, and can you reiterate a little, as an archaeologist, what is so fascinating about being able to get to tombs? I think so many of us, you know, we, you know, we, we've seen the Indiana Jones movies and all those kind of things. What, uh, what specifically about, you know, tombs and, and the, you know, the, the, the thoughts of the afterlife really gets archaeologists excited because I know we, we've talked a little bit about that and it seems like you, know, you might not see it on the surface but they really are amazing places for study. Well I mean it really is yeah I mean it's in the encapsulation the kind of epicenter of all of those individual cultures because so many times it's the houses the daily life the experiences they're not well preserved so they just recently found the first real city that you can examine in Egypt it's all about the tombs. Uh, for the Romans, we have the cities, but with that, with the exception of a Pompeii or Herculaneum, we have the Vesuvius eruption that preserved it. We just don't get the lives kind of frozen that we can walk into and say, oh, what happened in this house? We go to the tombs and it's one thing happened in that moment. The tomb was created. And so therefore it's locked in and we get that story being told of the decoration and so forth of that tomb as opposed to, as opposed to, um, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, coming into other sites that have been maybe used and abandoned and you're examining something that was used over uh, a bit of time. Yeah, I really love that. And, and thank you for, for explaining that. It's sort of the idea that these you know, tombs were designed to live on forever, to preserve. You know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about mummies, I think, in a second. And, yeah. uh, and so, you know, the whole idea that, you know, they, they built this to help remember who that person was, what was important to them. You know, they wanted it to stand the test of time, makes it such a nicely preserved place to do some archaeology work. So, uh, so thank you for, uh, for explaining that. Everybody was kind of like, hey, wait a second, why are we spending so much time, you know, in grave sites and all that? And it really is. They're sort of perfect spots for, uh, for archaeology. Hey, we've got one more on-screen question question for you here. Henry, I think had a, a great question. Henry, you are, uh, are live on the air with, uh, with Rome, with Dr. Darius Aria. What's your question? Um, what is it like to be in 
archaeologist. Well, yeah, being an archaeologist is, uh, well, you're spending a lot of time in the library. And being an archaeologist is you're teaching people. And, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that a fair amount of being an archaeologist is still about travel. So I, I, I do like to travel. And traveling for work, it's, it's really good because, you know, you're getting paid to travel. So that's always fun. Um, but no, really, it's, it's about exploring past civilizations and uh, in learning something. Every day, there's something stimulating you to, to read more, to talk with colleagues, to go see other sites, to, to put the things together. It's again, it's like a, it's a jigsaw puzzle, but you don't have half the pieces of the puzzle. So it's always one of those things where you've got to also use your imagination. And it's a lot of fun. I love that idea. You get to be a historian. You get to be a little bit of a scientist. You get to be a detective. You know, it seems like archaeology careers are, are really, really cool for uh, for that, um, you know, exact reason. So um, so thank you for sharing that. Hey, we had a lot of questions about people were fascinated by, uh, you know, by Vidal, by the, um, you know, the, the Roman soldier that uh, you know, kind of showed some of those artifacts there. Uh, and a lot of people wanted to know, you know, what, uh, what you know, do kids have toys back then in ancient Egypt and ancient Rome, all yep. those kind of things. One note, I'll, I'll take a quick answer part of that myself. We actually have a class coming up in a couple of weeks uh, with an Egyptologist, which is all about what it was like to be a kid in, in, in ancient Egypt. And so we'll see more of that. If you found that interesting, uh, check out the website. You'll be able to register for that. It's called uh, What It Was Like to Be a Kid in, uh, in Ancient Egypt. But, uh, but Darius, for, for you, what, um, you know, what, what do you find out as, as an archaeologist about what was life like for kids? How similar were they to, uh, to a lot of us as we were kids? Um, you know, that, that, was, that, that really kind of struck a chord with people. Yeah, I mean, look, guys, I mean, you might want to go back and live 2,000 years ago because you wouldn't have to brush your teeth because they didn't have toothbrushes the way that we do. And if you want to get your teeth really clean, you might use urine because it has ammonium in it to clean your teeth, which sounds pretty awful. So, I mean, look, you don't want to go back and live 2,000 years ago uh, because you didn't have modern medicine. Right? Then you use vaccines. And you think about you know, all the different kinds of advances that we have. So when you take yourself back in there, though, kids growing up, they're just like you. You know, you're going to lose your front teeth. Uh, you're going to be having uh, kid issues in school. You're going to have tests. You're going to get in trouble if you cheat. Um, you're going to have to learn something. Your parents want you to get a job. You're going to get married. I mean, all these different things are just like we have today. Uh, if you're lucky, the parents had to pay for school back then. So they, they want to get you uh, a decent education that you could read. Just think that most people back then couldn't read. So there are different things that uh, I think you can say you're lucky that you're growing up when you're growing up today. We have a lot more knowledge available to you. But still growing up, kids had imagination. Kids could get into trouble. Kids could have adventures. Kids could sneak out at night. Kids could break the rules. Kids could, you know, knock over the pretty picture and get in trouble in the house. So and kids would have to do their chores. So think of all the different things. I think we, you really can connect to those people. And when you see the toy, when you see the artifact, you can say, I can relate to that. You know, that's exactly what I'm going through. And, you know, they had summer vacation. Then it's back to school, folks. I'm sorry. And yeah, I don't want to go to school. You got to go to school. You got to get an education. So all those different things, parents harping on the kids, just like today. I'm sorry to tell you that. But because human nature is the same. But today we have smartphones. Today we have cars. Today we go on uh, airplanes or whatnot. So it's, uh, it's, uh, I think we can, we can connect when we read the stories about the Romans. Yeah, that, that really is, I think, fascinating to know and, and kind of ties together a lot of what we talked about today. This is, you know, a lot of archaeology is about telling this, the stories of the ancients, learning what they were like and kind of realizing, you know, like, you know, regardless of what time period you were in, what location of the world you were in, we're all a whole lot more similar than we are different. I think that's kind of a, a just a, a neat lesson to learn that those kids were a lot like you. Um, maybe that's a decent place to, to kind of tee you up for, uh, for your last question. Uh, we've yeah. got a lot of kids out here. Here who are very fascinated with ancient cultures and all those kind of things. We talked a little bit about the fact there's, there's more left to be discovered. So let me give you a two-parter here. Uh, what do you hope to discover? Or what do you hope is, is discovered, you know, in the next 50 years or so, if it's kind of your challenge, what do you, what do you want those kids out here of like working together? What are you all going to discover next? Well, oh man, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it is possible uh, for example, with new technologies, we'll find whole cities we didn't even know existed, let's say, in the, uh, in the Yucatan. So 
in, in, in Central America and Mexico. I think we're going to have huge discoveries over there. I think we're going to, I have a couple of friends that are underwater archaeologists. I'm certified scuba diver. So, but what it's all about is they've never really documented the bottom of the Mediterranean, for example. So they're finding ships and ships and ships, and they're finding better preserved ships all the time. So therefore, we're going to have grand discoveries with underwater archaeology and even river archaeology, even on the Tiber River. Then we're going to have, um, you know, we'll probably discover the remains of Cleopatra's tomb or something like that. So you have to, you know, think that we're going to be making a lot of discoveries because a lot more people are looking and there's a lot more technology. And then, of course, a big part of archaeology is preserving what we have. And I just want to see a whole bunch more preservation. They've done such a great job recently in the Colosseum and Pompeii. So I want to see more of that and see more people involved in archaeology and the preservation of the past. All right, everybody out there, you've got your challenge out there. There's plenty more to discover. There's a lot that we want to continue to keep preserved so future generations can continue to enjoy it. And uh, and I like what you mentioned about there are places we haven't been able to look. Uh, you know, we haven't had as many you know resources to be able to look. So there's so much out there to discover. Whether you're you know you're in Rome, you're in Petra, you're in Egypt, whether you're in Yucatan, or whether you're underwater. So uh, everybody's got their challenge out there. Darius, yep. thank you so much for another thank amazing very much. trip to Rome. Home and uh, and thanks to all of you out there for amazing questions. Uh, we we always get excited to uh, to check out your pictures up on on Instagram. And so with that, let me make sure uh, you guys have your instructions for the end. Darius gave you your instructions as an archaeologist. I'll give you your instructions as a, a photographer. Um, also want to give a, a huge shout out and thanks to the Ancient Adventures campers for all their participation during class. Some great questions on screen and uh, for helping us mm. out behind the scenes as well. So. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll see you back here soon for what it was like to be a kid in ancient Egypt. I know Dr. Ari has got a class coming up uh, in the fall again yep. as well. So we'll see you we'll in September. Back here soon. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you.